Okay, we're going to do the Claisen condensation. So, the Claisen condensation is a reaction that occurs between two esters, and typically it's done with the same ester reacting with itself, for reasons that will become obvious later. But if we think about this reaction, we put in an ester in the presence of a reasonably strong base, but this base is also a nucleophile, so our choice of base is kind of important here. We chose sodium ethoxide, and if we use sodium ethoxide as a nucleophile, it would attack our carbonyl carbon, form a tetrahedral intermediate, and kick out a leaving group. But the leaving group would be the same as the ethoxide that attacked in the first place. So that reaction wouldn't lead us anywhere productive. So instead, we can treat this in a different manner. We can ignore that possible reaction, and we can see what else is going to happen. Now, you'll have seen carbonyl carbons before, and you know that next to a carbonyl carbon, on the alpha position, these protons, there would be three, but I'll just draw in one, are reasonably easy to, um, to remove using a base. They're reasonably acidic, especially when you compare them to other carbons in alkyl chains. They're much, much, much more acidic. So, if you put in your strong base, it can deprotonate, and when it deprotonates, it forms a new oxygen-hydrogen bond. We form what's called an enolate. So we make our carbon-carbon double bond, the ene, and then we make the alcohol, the OH, or the carbon oxygen single bond and it's an 8 because it'll have a negative charge on it. So we make our enolate, so let's look at that. That's obviously a reversible step in equilibrium and in fact the equilibrium, if we were to draw this more accurately, would probably be more to this side than it is to this side, but our reaction progresses nonetheless, so let's see what happens. Well, let's draw what we had exactly as we had it, except for what the arrows have moved, so we had All of these bonds, we had our ethoxide, and let's just scrap the sodium now. So we'll ignore the sodium from here on in, because to be honest, it's not that interesting. It's not that much use to us. So ignoring the sodium, we took these two electrons and we formed a new oxygen-hydrogen bond. So we've taken that hydrogen. We took that pair of electrons that were between the carbon and the hydrogen, and we made a new carbon-carbon bond, so our ene and we took our carbon oxygen, one of those two bonds, and we put them up here to put the negative charge on the oxygen. So we made our enolate. And we know that enolates act as nucleophiles. So do we have an electrophile in this reaction? Well, I said that there was, you know, two esters in this. So let's redraw out our ester and see what's going to happen. We know that this is an electrophile, this is a nucleophile, so the two of them are going to react together. So Let's try that out. When an enolate acts as a nucleophile, typically, not always, but typically it will act as if the carbon is the nucleophile. So we reform our carbon-oxygen double bond, we take this pair of electrons that's in the carbon-carbon bond, and we make a new carbon-carbon bond from this carbon to this carbon. If we attack a carbonyl carbon, the same thing always happens. We break our carbon-oxygen double bond, and we form our tetrahedral intermediate. So, Let's look and see what happens after those arrows. So, on to the next step. I'll move that down here. Let's draw out everything that's up there that doesn't have an arrow going and changing it. Let's get rid of the ethanol, so let's lose the ethanol, because we're just not interested in watching the ethanol all the way through the reaction. And let's draw out all of these things, except for what's being moved by the arrows. So, our upper equivalent of ethyl acetate is going to be fairly unchanged. except for that bond, so if I get rid of that bond, oops, um, because that had an arrow going from it, and then our other equivalent, dry out everything, so one of these bonds, that was the carbon-carbon bond is still there, that's our oxygen, and then that's completely unchanged. So what do we do? We took this negative charge and we made a new carbon-oxygen double bond, we took this pair of electrons that was in the carbon-carbon bond, and we made a new carbon-carbon bond. We took that pair of electrons, which I accidentally drew in and have now erased, and we put it up onto the oxygen so that it has a negative charge on it. And here we're in a classic situation. When you attack a carbonyl carbon, you form a tetrahedral intermediate. So what's going to happen now? Our tetrahedral intermediate is going to collapse and kick out a leaving group if there's a leaving group available to kick out. Well, let's assess these three things to see if they'd be good, good leaving groups. If this leaves, then we're just going backwards. And that's a possibility, but it doesn't take us anywhere, so let's not pay any attention to it. 
our carbon is never going to leave. You're not going to have a carbon with a negative charge leaving on it, especially when it would just be a metal with a negative charge. That would be exceptionally unfavorable. By comparison, our oxygen will leave relatively happily with a negative charge in it. So let's reform our carbon-oxygen double bond and kick out the best leaving group to leave, which is going to be this one here. And even if it's not as good a leaving group as this, since this is equilibri in equilibrium, this will keep forming and eventually we'll get over to the next set. So let's draw out everything we have there. That negative charge has been moved by an arrow. That bond has been moved by an arrow. That bond is still there. That bond and all of the rest of it is also still there. So what did we do? We took that pair of electrons and we made a new carbon-oxygen double bond. So new carbon-oxygen double bond. We took this pair of electrons and we kicked out our oxygen with a negative charge on it. And what have we made? We've made a beta keto ester. It would help if I put in all of the carbons that were in there. So let me redraw this over here more clearly. This is going to be our product now. And it's what's described as a beta keto ester. So this is an ester functional group here. In particular, this carbon is where the ester is, but this carbon double bond oxygen with another single bond to an oxygen that then bonds to another carbon is an ester. And then that's the alpha position, that's the beta position. And so at the beta position you have a ketone, beta to the ester. So they are generally called beta keto esters. Now, all of this reaction is in equilibrium. So all of these steps go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So why does our reaction gather at this end and not at that end? Well, there's something else you need to do before you can get this product out. If you think about these protons here in the middle at the alpha position, what makes this proton acidic is that it's next to a carbonyl. These protons are next to two carbonyls. So they're going to be so easy to deprotonate that this base that we produced is going to deprotonate that before it ever gets recycled back into the reaction. And this will be held in its deprotonated form. But it's much less nucleophilic because it's much more stable than the ester when it's deprotonated or than our enolate. So this is going to be less reactive. And so our reaction is going to end up collecting over here until eventually we do an acidic workup. Okay, I hope that explains the reaction. If you have any questions, let me know. If you think I've made any mistakes or I've made something unclear, ask a question below or on the forum or in class. That's all for now. Bye.